Lonvo, where we left off, and then hopefully we'll come back to this. We won't. Yeah, we should be fine. Um, that's right. We left off with Lonval being stung with love that lit and inflamed his heart. And he tells whoever she is, because she is never named. Top of 191. Beautiful one, he says, if it pleased you that such, such joy should come to me, that you should wish to love me, you could command nothing that I would not do to the best of my power, be it folly or wisdom. Okay, That's completely within that courtly love tradition that we talked about. In that courtly love tradition, a lady of a castle, per se, would say to one or two or three, or if you're Guinevere, 10 or 20 or 30, you know, knights, do X, Y, Z for me and you will have my love. That's where we get this popular conception notion that medieval knights were off, going off into the woods to fight ogres, slay dragons, kill monsters to win their fair love. Yeah, where well, their fair love was usually not that fair. Um, if you think of fair as, you know, morality. Anyways, so what has he just said? Say anything, I'll do anything. Give me a command, I'll do it. Be it folly, foolishness, or wisdom. I will do what you command for you. I will give up everyone. Oh, man, this, he's got it bad. I mean, he's got this whole love sickness thing bad. I never wish to part from you. This is what I most desire. She likes this. How do I know? Line 133. She grants him her love and her body. Aren't they the same? Ooh. No. Love is where? Her body's sex. Love is immaterial. Love is not sex. Love is companionship. Love is, you know, mutual. I don't know what you want to call it. Adoration. Love is spiritual. Okay? So he gets, he gets the whole package, so to speak. Now Lonval is on the right path. In other words, whoa, Lonval's got it made. Because keep in mind, what are the guys at, the, at Camelot, back at Carlisle? What are they getting? Land and women. Land and women. He's got the women part. Woman. What about the land? None of it. Well, we'll see. She gave him still one more gift. He will never again want for anything but that he will have as much of it as he likes. Let him give and spend generously. She will provide him with enough. He has the ATM that doesn't run empty. Hmm. So, what were we told at the beginning of the poem about Lonval? He's a prince. King's son. He's living in a foreign land. That is, Arthur is not his father. His father is the king of a foreign land. He's generous. He's generous to the extent of now he's poor because Arthur isn't giving him anything. Now he's told, give freely. And you will what? Never want it. You will receive even more. There's a kind of a Christian idea in here of giving and receiving. Lonval is very well situated. In other words, now he has it made. The more richly he spends, the more gold and silver he will have. And she says, ah, but there's strings attached, right? Remember one of those laws that we talked about in the courtly love tradition I put up on the screen? You know, there were like 30 rules or 33 rules. One of those rules is what? It's what do you? Other people. It's exactly people. right. You have to keep your love affair secret. You can't blurt it out. Okay? Doesn't go on Twitter, doesn't go on social media, doesn't, doesn't get spread to the other knights, you know, in the quote unquote night locker room. She says, Now I warn you, I command and beg you, tell no one about this. I'll tell you the whole truth. You would lose me forever if this love were known. You could never see me again. Or have possession of my body. She understands rhetoric, save the most important thing for the end. 
Okay? He replies, don't worry about that, sister. <laughs> you know, well, not sister, but <laughs> I mean, he's not Oedipus, but <laughs> he says he'll hold of these commands. He lay down beside her on the bench. Now Lonval is well lodged. You could go all Freudian with that probably, but I wouldn't take that too far. He stays there until the evening. When did he go out? In the morning. So assuming he rides for an hour, goes off into the woods, 11 o'clock in the morning, the two women, it's like as soon as he lays down, puts his back against the tree, there come these two women. And he gets taken to their tent. So now he's lying with this woman, if she is a real woman and not uh, something else, till late afternoon. And he would have stayed longer if he could and his beloved had consented. But she says, get up, time for you to go. You go on, I will remain, one thing I will tell you. When you want to talk with me, there's no place you can think of where one could have his beloved without reproach or base behavior, that I will not be with you at once to do all your will. No man but you will see me or hear my words. So, if you ever want me, there's a song like James Taylor, Bill Withers, something, late 60s, early 70s, what? Carol King? I'll be there. <laughs> if you want me, just call out my name. It is James Taylor. It's Carol King's song. And I'll be there. And he's delighted by this. He kisses her. He gets up. The maidens cover him with rich clothes. They take him back to his horse after he washes his hands. He served very courteously. There is an excellent, excellent extra dish, notice, that greatly pleased the knight. What was that extra excellent dish? He often kissed his lady and embraced her tightly. Okay, they bring him his horse, put on its saddle. Notice, it has had excellent care. That is, the horse has been cared for. He gets up, goes back to the city. He looks back, and he's troubled. He goes along thinking about his adventure and worrying to himself. He's astonished, doesn't know what to think, cannot believe she's true. Comes to his lodging. Okay, He comes to his lodging. We've been told he can't believe it's true. What should make him believe this is true? He's got on new duds. He's got on new clothes. It, it, it didn't all happen in his mind. This wasn't a hallucination. He comes to his lodging, and what else? His men are now handsomely dressed. They've all got the same kind of clothes on that he has. Why? They, their livery, their uniform, matches his. It has his coat of arms, his heraldic emblems on it, whatever those are. That night he keeps a rich table. That means he has a blowout party. No knight in the town who greatly needed sustenance, whom Longval does not have brought to him, and well and richly served. In other words, if you're hungry, you can go to Longval. What else? He gave gifts. He ransomed prisoners. He clothed minstrels. That could mean that he employed minstrels, but the word for minstrel there could also imply the poor. Because the poor would sometimes sing for their food, like we have today. Longval did great honor. There was no stranger or dear friend to whom Longval would not give. In other words, Longval is practicing that Pentecost oath that I talked about the other day. Okay? He had great joy and pleasure. How do we know? Colon. What comes after the colon? It explains the great joy and pleasure. He can see his beloved often, whether by day or by night. She's entirely at his command. So, notice, that same year, after the Feast of St. John, about 30 knights were going out to enjoy themselves in an orchard below the tower where the queen was staying. What does that really mean? What are these 30 knights doing? 
Rosalie, you've got a grin on your face. What are they doing? They're showing off. They're trying to draw the attention of the queen and her ladies. Right? At least I think so. They're going out to enjoy themselves. Gowan is with them and his cousin, the handsome Evane. Gowan or Gawain, depending on how you pronounce the second syllable. The noble, the worthy, who made himself so beloved by everyone and said, by God, my lords, we do wrong. Why? Because we haven't brought Lonval. So these 30 knights, they're out there having fun. And Sir Gowan thinks of Lonval, who is so generous and courteous and whose father is a rich king. Oh, so they think it's coming from his father. Could be. So what do they do? They go back to Lonval's place. They persuade him to come. Meanwhile, back at the top of the tower, the queen is sitting on a ledge looking out. She looked at the king's household. She looked at Longval and considered him. What does that mean, she considered him? I mean, you could go all biblical and say she lusted in her heart because that's exactly what she does. She calls one of her ladies, sent for her maidens, the most excellent and lovely. They're going to go out. The maidens are going to go out and do what? Appraising. They're going to go enjoy themselves there where the men were in the orchard. If you want to read into that, feel free to. She took 30 or more of them with her, that is, of her ladies. 30 men plus one. 30 or more. So, the knights, they're delighted to see the ladies. They took the ladies by the hand. The conversation was not unrefined. Notice, this isn't trash talk. This isn't, hey, Abigail, let's you and I go behind the bushes. It's, this is refined. It's polite. Lonval goes off by himself. Notice, the implication is, each of the 30 knights has a woman. Longball goes off by himself. It seemed long to him until he can have his beloved kiss, embrace, and touch her. Why? I mean, what's he have to do? Snap his fingers, call out her name, whatever. He little values others' joy if he does not have what pleases him. Others' joy. Now that can be taken to mean he little values or has joy in what others have joy in, or he has little value or joy in the company of others. Why? Because they cannot please him like she can. That doesn't only mean by her body, by the way. So the queen sees him, and she goes off to him, sits by him, and she showed him all her feelings. Which, according to the Wanderer, the Seafarer, Beowulf, they all say what about showing your feelings? Don't. Don't. Don't do this. Okay? And what does she say? Longfall, I have honored you greatly, loved you, and held you very dear. Have honored you greatly. That implies it began in the past, and it's continuing to now. Now, Longfall could be thinking... When? When did you honor me greatly? When isn't did you kind of love weird, me? Though, because like that's kind of like her mother, isn't his mother, isn't it? In no. a way? I mean, since King Arthur's kind of raising him. Not necessarily. We don't know why Longball is there. He might, I said the other day, he might be fostered there. Could also just be that he's there for some other reason. Yeah, but if he's being fostered, it's not like raising. It's more like, I'm training you to be a warrior. Or a king. Or a king. Yeah. yeah. So, you can have all my love, so tell me your desire. Now, that means body and soul. You can have me. Take me. We're going to see the same idea, by the way, in Sir Gowan and Green Knight. We're going to see a woman offer herself to Sir Gowan. In no uncertain terms, by the way. I mean, it's going to be pretty... She's going to say... Oh, you're so big and strong. You could take me if you want to. 
And he's kind of like, not in my land, we don't do that. <laughs> so. Is the queen like, you know, always going after all King Arthur? Queen of her ears. <laughs> queen of her ears. There's another version of, the, uh, let me get to this and then I'll talk about that other version. So, she says, I am willing to be your lover. You should be delighted with me. <clears throat> Why did you go, <clears throat> what does that mean? What is she saying? Oh, Longball, yes, I deign to love you. You may have me now. Go ahead, take me. That's what she's kind of doing. Okay? And what does Lonval say? Maybe let me be. He violates all the rules of courtly love right here. He violates the other day I put right up above courtly love. I wrote right here, chivalry. He violates the laws of chivalry. Okay? Courtly love said, if you have to deny a woman what she desires, you got to make sure that you deny her in such a way that she doesn't feel rejected. Okay, guys. <laughs> so, so we're all what? We're screwed from the beginning. I mean, because there's just no way to do that. Okay? Yeah. Just utterly. So how does he, quote, unquote, deny her without her feeling rejected? Woman, get off me. Woman, lady, let me be. <laughs> Like, <laughs> I have no interest in loving you. <laughs> wow, that's like, no, you're ugly, you old hag. You know. I'm not attracted to you. For a long time, I have served the king. Well, okay, so man, he's qualifying it. No, no, this is because of my duty to Arthur. For a long time, I've served the king. I don't want to betray my faith to him. No, maybe she could go. Never for you or for your love shall I wrong my Lord. She gets furious. That's not good enough. And she says, oh, I understand. It's quite clear to me you have no interest in that pleasure, sex, with a woman. It's important to have that with a woman. People have often told me that you have no desire for women. <laughs> you have shapely young men and take your pleasure with them. Now, so wait, you just called him gay? Yes, she did. <laughs> but gay, 2018, that has, you know, neutral connotations. That's not what she, this is not a neutral connotation back in 1375 to 1400 when this is written. This is okay. you can get any form. Oh, yeah, these, these, them's fighting words in Lonval's case. And then she keeps going. Yeah, she doesn't stop there. This is like Beowulf in his flitting episode, right? Base coward, infamous wretch, my lord is greatly harmed by having allowed you near him. Even having one of your kind near him harms Arthur's reputation. I believe that he will lose God by it. God, who hates gays, obviously, you know, isn't going to Look at Arthur and go, well, it's okay, he didn't know. When he heard this, he was very distressed. That's probably putting it mildly. He was not slow to respond. That is, I don't think he had to think very long before he came up with this response. Out of anger, he said something that he would often regret. Now, what is the poet, Maria Franz, doing with that little two lines? He will always regret. Okay, what else? I'm always out to myself. Don't speak out of anger. I think that's the poet getting in a little bit of advice. Don't speak out of anger. Okay? And he says, I know nothing about that line of work. In other words, how dare you? But he doesn't stop. This is why he regrets it. But I love and am the beloved of one who should be valued more highly than all the women I know. The one I love is valued more than all the women I know. Well, who does obviously all the women I know include? Including the one sitting right in front of me telling me that she wants me. And I'll, oh, and notice, he doesn't stop. Floodgates open. I'll tell you one thing. Know it well and openly. 
any one of those who serve her, even the poorest maid, is worth more than you, lady queen, in body, face, and beauty, in manners and goodness. Okay, even the poorest maid implies what's the poorest maid's job in a castle, in a king's house? Who would have the worst job? The sh someone. chambermaid. The one who comes in in the morning, pulls the bedpan out from under the bed, and empties it. That person. Or maybe the scullery maid, the one washing dishes in the kitchen. He says, the least of her maids is better than you. How? Body. They got, they all, they've got greater bodies than you do. Face, you're a hag compared to them. And beauty. Manners, how dare you <laughs> come up and say such things about me. And goodness. Wholesomeness. Okay. So let me pause here and tell you a little bit about Guinevere. There's another version of this story called Sir Launfall, L-A-U-N, N, F-A, might have two L's. And in this one, I got to put this cap on. In this one, the upshot of the story is the Knights of the Round Table are sitting around the round table, and they have a drinking game. And the drinking game is they have a drinking horn, not a plastic bottle, and the horn has been charmed. It's been bewitched. Okay? So that whoever drinks out of that horn, if his beloved is false to him, he will spill a little. Okay? And depending upon how false the beloved is, he might spill a lot. And so part of the, what goes on in the thing is the thing comes around the table and the guy's going, oh, well, you know, my wife, Lisa, nah, she would never, and they drink, and, you know, a little bit dribbles down the chin. It's like, oh, okay, so she's cheated on me once. It goes around and it comes to Arthur. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even get the damn horn to his lips and water, you know, whatever is in it is spewing out like a fire hose. <laughs> What's this tell us about Guinevere? She cheated on him for every man. Guinevere, let's put it this way. Guinevere's been around the block. <laughs> and at every door on the block. <laughs> okay? So, back to the story. She leaves at once. She goes into her chamber crying. <gasps> I can't believe what he said about me. She's very upset. She takes her bed, sick. Says she's not going to get up until the king does the right thing. What does this sound like? <coughs> she takes to her bed, crying, says, I'm not getting out of bed until Arthur does the right This is a three-year-old throwing a tantrum. Okay? Arthur comes back from the woods. He's had a very pleasant day. <laughs> I never saw that before until just now. <laughs> I've been teaching this thing for over 20 years. That line never hit me. So <laughs> are these beginning to get up with the fairy queen as well? <laughs> no. I was just like, I haven't had to deal with my wife all day. Well, that's usually, you know, he's been off hunting, doing that kind of thing. But I kind of now wonder. What's Arthur been doing off in the woods? Because <laughs> usually in medieval literature, a knight rides out to the woods, especially if he's by himself. Fairies come and abduct him. And in almost, in the vast majority of medieval literature that deals with the fairies, when the fairies abduct you, it's for one thing. It's sex. You become a sex slave. I mean, we think sex trafficking is a modern... new. No. Okay? And we have stories of people who come back from the fairy realm. And they're just kind of, you know, like stone. Buzzed out of their minds for the rest of their lives. Little example, Keats. La Belle de Sans Merci. Read that little poem. That's about a knight who has been abducted by the beautiful maiden without mercy. Who is a fairy. Uh, 
woman. Anyways, so she makes her appeal to Arthur. She says, Lonval shamed her. And what does she say? Does she say, I went to him. I told him I wanted him to be my lover. Here is my body. And he turned me down and said I was ugly compared to... No, she doesn't want it. She pulls... She pulls a Potiphar's wife on him. Anybody know who Potiphar is? Joseph's master. That's right. Joseph, Old Testament story, uh, Genesis. Joseph, after he sold into slavery by his brothers, is taken to Egypt, rises to a position of power in the guy who bought him's house, Potiphar's house. And one day, while Potiphar is off in the woods, his wife says, Joseph, you can have me. He's like, no. He runs away. She pulls her cloak off, calls her guards and said, oh, he tried to rape me. Joseph gets thrown in prison. And then that later stuff happens where he answers the, uh, resolves the dreams and such. So, King got extremely angry, angry swore his oath. If Longval cannot defend himself in court, he will have him burnt or hanged. Notice, it's not where Arthur's just going to go off and kill him. Ah, you got to hear what the knights judge. So, they get Lonval, who has sorrow and trouble enough. Notice, he has sorrow and trouble enough before the three knights go and get him. Why? He's working up a secret. Hey, baby, where are you? <laughs> He's snapping his fingers, and she's not coming. Because it was quite evident to him he had lost his beloved. Okay? So, we get several lines about how pitiful he is. He laments and sighs. He curses his heart and his mouth. Cannot cry out or wail. Alas, 351. What will he do? So, the men come. He's taken to the king. And the king says, 363. Vassal, you have done me a great wrong. You shouldn't have insulted my queen. You boasted foolishly. So how can he resolve the issue to the king's satisfaction? Not the queen's, the king's. What's he told to do? What must every prosecutor do in a court of law in order to get a conviction? Present the evidence. What's the evidence in this case? Produce the body. <laughs> we need to see her. That is, it'll be myself, the king, and the knights of the round table. We'll determine. And is it just his lover? Or could he say, um, we want to see her lowest, poorest, slimiest, mm -hmm. ugliest maid. <laughs> and if she outdoes, you know, Guinevere, then okay. Lonval decides, denies the dishonor. He says, I never did that to her. Okay, yeah, I did say those things, but I didn't go after her first. No, she's lying. So, skipping a bit, the nobles return to the king because they have their little judgment, and they say, Lonval's got to produce the evidence. And Lonval goes off to his lodging. Gawain, we're told, will stand surety for Lonval, that is, let whatever the judgment be fall upon him if Lonval skips town. In other words, Gawain is what? He's the bail. Okay? So, 410 and following, every day knights go to see him, see how he's doing, whether he's eating or drinking, that is, is he trying to kill himself? And on the day they had named, that is, the trial court date comes. Everybody assembles around the round table. They bring Lonval. Everybody is sad for him. They would have done anything like 420 and following in their power to free him. He was very wrongly accused. How do they know that? Well, because Guinevere's from Because they know Guinevere. Okay? Mm. It's just the king's not willing to, you know. Admit it. Yeah. So... The king asked for the record, that is, read the charges, essentially. 
And let's see here. 461. They sent to Lonval, told him, announced to him, he should have his beloved come to defend and bear witness. That if he couldn't, that's not a good thing. 469. The king urged them fiercely for the sake of the queen who is waiting, just as they are about to give their verdict. That is, it's like time, the trial's going on, time's going by, and the king's like, that's enough. That, he's had his chance. And what do they see? Two maidens come riding into town on two beautiful, brisk palfreys. 473. Four. They were extremely lovely. Dressed in nothing but purple taffeta down to their bare skin. Everyone gazes at them. Sir Gowan and the three knights, they go to Lombo and they go, Look! He's happy. Make him to say whether this was his beloved. Now, I think that could mean something. What, what could Sir Gowan be saying there? Yep, prettier than Guinevere. He could mean, because what, what have they been told Lombo said? The least is prettier than Guinevere. Better in face, body, etc. So by saying, is this your beloved? He might be going, yeah. <laughs> Lonvo, nope, don't know who those are. They're obviously not the two that he met in the wood. The maidens ride along in their horses. They go into the castle, and they ride right up to Arthur. And they say, um, get your chambers ready, hung with silks where my lady can dismount. She wants to take lodging. It doesn't mean with him. She means at his house. Okay. So the king says, okay, get the rooms ready for them. And then I go, oh, we forgot what we were talking about because these two not, oh, gorgeous women just came in. Um, no, we haven't. Uh, let's resume the trial. They keep talking. Two more ladies come riding down the street. Noble bearing, dressed in cool silks, riding two Spanish mules. The vassals were delighted by this. A second show. Yeah, I mean, they're going, okay, now Lonval is saved. There's no other way to read that then. Better looking than Guinevere. Evan goes to him and says, rejoice for the love of God. Speak. Here come two maids, very elegant and beautiful. Surely it is your beloved. Lonval kind of, nope, not her. They dismount before the king. They say, provide rooms for us in order to receive my lady. She's coming here to speak to you. So first she was just coming to spend the night. Like Camelot's been converted to Howard Johnson's or something. Or Motel 6. Okay. So he sends them off. He asks the nobles, come on. Why? 345, excuse me, 545. The queen was getting angry. Why do you think the old queen is getting angry? Because she's getting jealous. And she's going to do it wrong. Yeah, because two, four beautiful women have just ridden into a hall. They're about to take a decision and when through the town they saw a maiden come riding on a horse. In all the world there was none more beautiful. Not the horse, the lady. She rode a white palfrey. Why white? Purity. Purity. Yeah. Which carried her well and gently. It had a well, the horse had a well-shaped neck and head. No answer, handsomer animal under heaven. Palfrey was richly harnessed. How richly? No count or king under heaven could have afforded the whole thing without selling or mortgaging land. She was dressed in a there's that word again a shift of white linen, which let both her sides be seen. So it's like a long piece of cloth with a head hole that she throws over so that all the way down the sides is open. But laced. She had a lovely body, a long, I have no idea really what a long waist means. Maybe she, I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will get in trouble. She had a long, 
a lovely body, a long waist, a neck whiter than snow on a branch, sparkling eyes, white skin, beautiful mouth, well-formed nose, all good things, dark eyebrows, lovely forehead, curling golden hair. No golden thread casts such a gleam as did her hair in the sun. Mantle, dark purple. Why purple? Royalty. Royalty. She had wrapped its ends around her. She had a sparrow hawk on her fist. Why? Again, royalty. Only royalty or aristocracy could go falconing. Okay? Which wasn't necessarily just a falcon. It could also be hawks and kestrels and such. And a greyhound behind her. No one in the town, great or small, not the old men nor the children, who did not go to look at her. That is, everyone did. Now, I also think there's a possibility that Marie de France heard of the tale of Lady Godiva. Anybody know what that story is? Nope. Not the maker of chocolate. Lady Godiva was an Anglo-Saxon woman. Um, at the same time, and if I remember correctly, in the same town as Leverich, Bishop of Exeter, the guy who owned the Exeter manuscript, okay? And the myth is, the story is, I can't remember what caused this to happen, but she swore an oath, and to fulfill her oath, not because she lost it, she rode into town totally nude. Yeah. And the people, because of their respect for her, rather than everybody running out to see her, everybody turned away. Okay? Because they didn't want to see her exposed. And I'm, I kind of think Marie de France heard a version of that, and she inverts it for this purpose. The judges who saw her considered it a great marvel. It what? This beautiful woman riding in on the horse. As they saw her pass, there was no joking about her beauty. She came along quite slowly. That is, she comes along, her horse is just very slowly handling, and it's almost like if, as if she's standing on a lazy Susan on the back of the horse, just, you know. All right, all eyes here. Hey, everybody. Are we good here? <laughs> And she comes up, <clears throat> and she speaks to, um, excuse me, the men come to Longbow, and they say, um, here comes one who is not tawny nor dark. She's the loveliest in the world of all the women who live. He kind of lifts his head because he's just slumped down against the wall. He's just giving up hope. Looks out the window and goes, hot oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> in faith, it is my beloved. Now I care little who may kill me. <laughs> you want to kill me? Go ahead, kill me. Why? You saw her again. If she does not take pity on me, for I am cured when I see her, she enters the palace. Such beauty had never come there. Ow! That stings, if you're Guinevere. She dismounts before the king. I'm not quite sure how to read this next line. So that she could easily be seen by all. That could mean how she gets off the horse. She lets her mantle fall so that they could see her better. Now her mantle covers her. She lets that drop. The king, who was very well bred, got up to meet her, right? Like Longball did when the two maidens come down by the riverside. He stands up. And all the others honored her and offered themselves to serve her. That All those others... Yeah, that's the knights of the round table. They're going, me, 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 me. <laughs> when they had looked at her well and greatly praised her beauty, she speaks. She's, she's in a hurry, notice. She does not wish to delay. Even though the first two came and said, um, our lady's coming, she wants to spend the night. Not really. She doesn't want to spend the night. Well, not there and not with him. I have fallen in love with one of your vassals, Longball. He was accused in your court. 
I do not wish it to be held against him. Concerning what he said, go away. Go away. Concerning what he said, you should know the queen was wrong. <laughs> he never asked for her love. In other words, liar. Because <laughs> who's sitting next to Arthur? Probably a Guinevere. Guinevere. Yeah, either fuming or slinking down in her chair. Oh, and concerning the boast he made, well, if he can be acquitted by me, have your nobles set him free. Good. Are we good here? Am I? Stand, you know, line up. <laughs> what, do you, what do you guys think? Her? Me. <laughs> he is free by their decision. There is not one who does not judge that Lamball has completely won his case. He is free by their decision, and the maiden takes her leave. King couldn't keep her. The implication is he tries. Spin the night. <laughs> Outside the hall was set a great block of dark marble, where heavy men mounted, who were coming from the king's court. That is, this is the marble they get up on so that they can get up onto or off of their horse when they come back from fighting. Why? Because their armor weighs so much. She comes, she and Lonval get up on the horse. With one leap, Lonval jumped on the palfrey behind her, and with her he went to Avalon. What your footnote tells you is associated with the Celtic Otherworld, which... In some versions of the Arthur myth, is where Arthur is taken after his final battle when he is mostly dead by his son Mordred. Right? He is at Avalon for what purpose? So we come up. Rest in what's the other R? Rest and recuperation. Right? In according to some versions of the myth, when Britain has its greatest need again, Arthur will return. I mean, that's part of the myth. Arthur's not dead. He's just resting. And when Britain has its biggest need, you know, World War II wasn't it. <laughs> I mean, the Germans didn't invade. They just bombed the hell out of it. The French did. <laughs> In 1066, you would kind of think, you know, that would be a... I mean, they got it. They got it. That's right what I was thinking. So, that's where Longwall goes. He goes off and lives with the fairies, the other people. Probably stoned out of his mind. <laughs> Maybe not stoned, but something else. <laughs> okay, so down in the Green Knight. We have 25 minutes. So we talked about all this. We'll talk about the pentangle when we get to it. So, look at the opening of this. First 30, 40 lines. How do we start? The burning of Troy. Troy. This is a foundational myth. There are several poems in several poems and works of literature in early English literature that deal with this foundational myth. B does it, for example, in his history. Who do the Britons descend from? Brutus, son of Aeneas, son of Priam of Troy. In other words, the Brits, they're Trojans. Now, how cool is that for a national mythology? You want to be a Trojan. It'd be better to be Greek, obviously, because the Trojans lose. So you're descendant of the losers. But still, you got this great literature about your ancestry, etc. So, after we get all the introduction about Aeneas and such, we're told, line 37, the king is spending Christmas at Camelot. <coughs> With many of his noble, gracious lords, there's revelry, they're having fun, dinner is served, there was a tournament. Yeah, there's tournaments, there's jousting, all just people having a great time. Guinevere is gaily dressed, placed in the middle of the high seat, because keep in mind that the hall here you know, looks like 
If you're familiar with the Harry Potter films, one, I'm sorry, because um, they're so horrible. <laughs> but, you know, you've got cables like this, and then you have the dais, or what it's called, a high table up here. Okay? The king is sitting here, and the queen's probably off to his right, and then there's others, oh, Sir Gowan and all these others up here. And down here is where all the slob knights are eating. This is on a hall thing. Might be that they're all sitting at a round table, though. Okay? So, we're told... Why do you have seats that way, though? Pardon? No, why do you want seats that way, though? Yeah, but the round table seats 100. Okay. The round table is big. Go to Winchester, England, today. Go to the Great Hall, which survives from the Middle Ages. Look at the wonderful architecture of it, hand hewn beams and all that. And then look at the big old table up on the wall in the back. The sucker is like 50 feet in diameter. I mean, it's huge. And it's got 100 seats. And at the top is the image of Arthur. The table, the wooden table itself, dates from the late Middle Ages. I don't remember exact years, like 1350 or later. Okay? The image of King Arthur, however, was painted in the early 16th century. Because the original King Arthur that was on there got a touch-up, got repainted. Anybody know who Arthur was made to look like in the early 16th century? Henry VIII. That's pretty good. You put your face as Arthur. One of either Charles's or Will's, Prince William's, middle names, because he's got like five, is Arthur. I mean, you, you kind of keep that mythology going back. So anyways, they're sitting there, and we're told, line 85, Arthur wouldn't eat until everyone was served. It's kind of the opposite of what happens. Well, yeah. He was so lively in his youth, a little boyish. What else? So he wouldn't eat until everyone was served. He would never eat 91 on such a special day. Also, until he'd been told a curious tale about some perilous thing of some great wonder that he could believe. Or, we're told, unless some marvel happens. So he doesn't eat until everybody is served. Why? It's manners. It's courtesy. Host eats first. Host takes the first bite. He won't eat until everybody is served. Now, does that mean he gets his food first? Because if it does, his is cold <laughs> by the time everybody else is served. Okay? Or he also won't eat until he hears a wonderful story, a story of some marvel, or sees something. So what happens? Everybody's sitting there. And we're told, we get lots of descriptions, right? Descriptions of their clothing. <clears throat> descriptions of the interior of the hall. And in rides a man. Completely green. Line 136. There bursts in the hall door a terrible figure in his stature, the very tallest on earth, from the waist to the neck so thick and set... Thick set and square, his loins and his limbs so massive and long, half a giant. In green, head to toe. All arrayed in green, his hair is green, his beard is green, his horse is green. Everything on his horse is green. Okay? 179. Most attractive was this man attired in green, that is, other than green. <laughs> Hair of his head matching his horse, fine outspreading locks cover his shoulder, great beard hangs down over his chest like a bush. He's got one of these big spade beards, you know. We get a description of the horse's trappings and all this kind of stuff. And what does the knight do? Let's play a game. 224. Still on his horse, he rides up to the dais. I'm going to pretend Connor's Arthur. And he looks him in the face and says, 
Where is the governor of this assembly? And then he looks to the people beside, and then he looks around to everybody else. Glad should I be to clap eyes on the man and exchange with him a few words. Now, it's not aware, or it's not evident to us, <clears throat> but in the Middle Ages, this would have taken to be a slam. This is a slap across Arthur's face. Because traditionally in, middle, in medieval literature or Middle English literature, it's clear that the king is the king. That is, there, there are things about the king that immediately make you go, not king, where you just can't make a mistake about it. And he looks him in the face and goes, who's the king? And them fighting words. He looks down at the knights, he rides up and down, waiting to see who had the most renown. And there's just silence. People are surprised. And we're told, so the folk there, 240, judged it phantasm or magic. That is, that he's all green and such. For this reason, many noble knights feared to answer. They're like, ooh, maybe there's something you know, wrong, demonic like going on here. Then Arthur says, oh, you're welcome to this place, 252. I am master of this house. My name is Arthur. Uh, that would be me. I'm, I'm the king. And says, take a seat. Spend some time. And what you have come for, we shall learn later. That is, sit down. Rest yourself. And the knight says, no, by heaven, in him who sits there. By heaven, in him who sits there is what? By God and Jesus. Yeah. What else is it? It's an oath. He's just sworn an oath. To spend time in this house was not the cause of my coming. I, by God in heaven, I didn't come here to sit down. Nope. Here's where I came. Your name, sir, is so highly regarded. Your city and your warriors reputed the best. Reputed the best. Dauntless in armor, horseback of field, the most valiant, excellent of all living men. Da, da 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 And courtesy is here displayed, as I have heard tell. So, your name, highly regarded, your men reputed. Courtesy here, as I have heard tell. Three phrases that imply, you know, I've heard good things about you. That he's there for what? A challenge. You may be assured, assured by this branch that I carry that I approach you in peace, seeking no battle. Is he carrying an olive branch? Because that's what we associate with peace. Or he's no. carrying like a tree branch. He's carrying a holly branch. Okay. For I had traveled, had I traveled in fighting dress. So he says what? I'm here in peace. I don't want to fight. If I wanted to fight. Had I traveled in fighting dress or warlike manner, I have a halberd at home, a helmet too. Shield, keen spear, shining bright, other weapons. Now, I don't, I don't seek any combat. I'm not dressed for that. But if you are as courageous as everyone says, most important word there? But. No. If. What's he implying? You're not. I've heard your reputation, but reputations can be... Misleading. Misleading. Manufactured. You will graciously grant the game that I asked for by rep. Game. Okay? I should put that in parentheses. Why? Because beheading's not often thought of as a game, right? Well, no, it's a okay. game to him because else? He's, he's immune. Okay. The he's not inhuman. The challenge isn't clear. Let me just the say. challenge isn't. One of you gets to behead me, and then I get to behead you back. That's not the game. That's not the game. What's the game? You do the wound on me, I get to do the same wound on you. It's a striking, or if you want, a swinging game. 
You get to take a shot at me, I get to take a shot at you. Okay? And Arthur says, well, if you seek... Courteous Knight. Why don't you turn the page? Courteous Knight, a combat without armor, you will not lack a fight. Well, what did the Green Knights just say? I'm not here to fight. Arthur, if you want to fight, buddy. I'm like, hello, Arthur, wake up. No, I seek no battle. I assure you truly. Why? Look at the next line. If they weren't offended before, they were offended after this. You know about me in this hall are but beardless children. Wow. You're a bunch of prepubescent boys compared to me. Who's that include? Arthur. Uh, Arthur. Arthur. Okay, leave Arthur alone for a moment. Lancelot? Guine uh, not Guinevere. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> Lancelot, Gawain, those two are like one and two in the most renowned knights in the world. Undefeated. Galahad, Bors, Yvain, Agravain, Bedivere. Brave Robin. Wait, 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 wait. Percival, yeah. Tristan, Lonval. I mean, you could, the list goes on and on. He says, you're a bunch of panty wastes. <laughs> if I were locked in my armor on a great horse, pff, no one here could match me with their feeble powers. Ooh, Gawain. <laughs> I shiver. <laughs> That's what he's going to say. Okay? They're, no, no, no. A Christmas game. Right? It's Christmas time. Should be a time of what? Merriment. Revelry. Merriment. See, in the United States, we do it all wrong. We have Christmas. Everything leads up to Christmas, and then what is December 26th? National Depression Day. Especially if you're a little kid. Why? Presents are all open and nothing. Middle Ages, you have what? The 12 days of Christmas. It starts on Christmas, and then you have revelry for 12 days. Yeah, Shakespeare maybe. writes a play, Twelfth Night. The Twelfth Night is the conclusion. Okay? So he's saying, let's, let's, let's just have a game. It's like a tournament, like a jousting tournament. All right? That was it. So, no, no, a game. For it is Yule and New Year, and here are brave men. At, that is, it'll be a game of strength. Okay? I mean, because we're men. If anyone in this hall thinks himself bold enough, so dowdy in body, reckless in mind. What does it mean to be reckless? Without thought. With Literally, without thought. Okay? As to strike a blow fearlessly and take one in return, you can have this big old battle axe. So, take your best shot and take one in return. That's the game. That's it. Does that imply beheading? Nope. No. It could imply punching. It could imply quarterstaff fighting. Okay. This ponderous axe to use as he pleases. And I shall stand the first blow and arm it. Come on, take your shot. Give me your hardest shot. Okay. If anyone is fierce enough to take up my challenge, Run to me quickly, seize this weapon. I renounce all claim to it. Let him keep it as his own. And I shall stand his blow and flinching on this floor, provided you agree that I get a do deal such a one in return. But I won't do it right now. I'll give you 12 months and a day. A year and a day. In a year and a day, you got to find me and take your licking. And he take her son. Anyone want to play this game with me? It's kind of like Dirty Harry. Well, yeah, punk, <laughs> you think you're lucky? If you petrified them at first, even stiller were then all the courtiers in that place, the great and the small. Why? Because he's a half-giant. Okay, is it because he's half-giant? Is it because they're cowardly? Or is it because they're trying to work out? How does this work? I hit him really, really hard so he doesn't get up. How do I, how does he pay me back in a year and a day? And so he says, is this Arthur's house that everyone talks of in so many kingdoms? 
Where are now your arrogance? Is it ever good to be called arrogant? No. no. It's never good to be called arrogant. He doesn't say, where is now your pride? Because pride can be okay. Pride can be earned. You know, the exam was worth 130 points if you got all the extra credit points. If you got 130 points, you should take pride in that. If you got 100 points, you should take pride in that. Okay? Arrogance? No. Where are now your arrogance and your victories, your fierceness and wrath and your great speeches? Now the revelry and repute of the round table are overthrown with a word. In other words, man, I've heard great stuff. That's what? Words. What are stronger than words? Actions. 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 Deeds. Now Arthur gets upset. And he goes, what you demand is absurd. But since you've asked for folly, that you deserve. No man knows to me. No man known to me fears your boastful words. That is, none of these men are afraid of you. Give me your act. I'll take a swing at you. And Arthur goes to him, takes the axe, and then proudly the other one dismounts and stands there. That is, the Green Knight gets off his horse. He's getting ready to take his hit. And what are we told? 335. Uh, take it back. 339. Seated by Guinevere, then bowed the good Gawain, and says, I beg you in plain words to let this task be mine. He asks Arthur. Notice he doesn't get up. He's still seated. Why? Courtesy. He's not been told by the host you can get up. If you would, noble lord, bid me rise from my seat and stand at your side. And I think the implication is Arthur goes, go ahead. If without discourtesy I might leave the table and that my liege lady were not displeased, I would offer you counsel before your royal court. For it seems to me unfitting if the truth be admitted, when so arrogant a request is put forward in all, even if you are desirous to undertake it yourself, while so many brave men. Arthur, you shouldn't be doing this. Why? You got all kinds of guys here who can die. <laughs> Rather than you. And then what does he say? He's a lot more disposable. Oh, shucks, Uncle Artie. 354. I am the weakest of them I know. You got 100 knights. I am number 100. I am the weakest of them. And I'm the dullest minded too. <laughs> so my death would be least lost if truth should be told. In fact, the only reason I get to sit up here at the big table and not down here with the little kid's table is what? He's related. You're my uncle. Well, Uncle Artie, Uncle Artie. It's kind of what he's doing here. No virtue I know in myself but your blood. So, let me do it. Arthur commands him to stand up. He says, take care, man. <laughs> and notice, Arthur gives him advice. Look at the advice. 372. Take care that you strike one blow. And if you deal it aright, truly I believe you will wait a long time for his stroke in return. Now, what's he telling him? You you kill him right there. Kill the dirty SOB for having offended us. Game still? <laughs> Arthur's, hmm, he's a little angry here. So Gawain approaches the man with the axe and says, um, just, just, just before I take a swing, let's go over this contract again. And the knight says, um, who are you? What's your name? Tell me truly so I can believe you. And Sir Gowan says, I'm called Gawain. And whatever happens this day, next year, I'll accept from you from with whatever weapon you choose. And from nobody else. He goes, oh man, I'm so glad it's you. By God, Sir Gowan, I am pleased that I shall get from your hands what I have asked for here. You fully repeated exact terms without omission, the whole thing. Okay, you have to agree, 395, seek me yourself, wherever you think I may be found. Sir Gowan, 
Notice, what information does he want before he takes a swing? Where do I find you? Yeah, what's your address? Where's your dwelling? I don't know where you are, where you live. Nor do I know you, nor your court, nor your name. That is, you know me, you know where I live, you know my court. Who are you again? Eh, you don't need to know all that yet. So, if I answer you truly after taking the blow, I will tell you at once, my house, my home, my proper name. Then you can pay me a visit. What should be going through Sir Gowan's mind at this point? Don't That's kill right. him, just kind of tap him. <laughs> yeah, there's something, something fishy about this. You know, if it's too good to be true... So the Green Knight readily takes up his position. Notice, he's taking up his position for the game. Does he do this? All right, go ahead. Hit me. No, he's just kind of like, hey. He bends over, pulls his hair up to expose his bare neck. He's telling Sir Gallen, here's where you're going to hit me. I know what you're thinking. Go ahead. Take your best shot. And Sir Gowan does what? He grasps the axe, lifts it up high, left, sets his left foot before him on the ground. Why is he set his left foot before him? What's the author telling us? Remember, we don't know who the author is. Completely anonymous. He's, He's right-handed. Why? This is an axe, uh, wood splitting, wood chopping position. He puts that left foot forward. He grabs that big old axe like this. Hand up here, top of the handle next to the head so that when he swings that hand's going to come down and add even more force. What kind of swing is he going for? Decapitation. This is a home run. This is, yeah, decapitation. Okay? How hardly does he swing? He brought it down swiftly on the bare flesh, 423, so that the bright blade slashed through the man's spine and cut through the white flesh, severing it too, so that the shining steel blade bit into the floor. This floor is not dirt, and it's not wood. It's stone. He sinks the blade into the stone. Okay. Why does it say white flesh there when it's, he's said to be completely green? Well, you cut through outside. Mm -hmm. It's flesh on the inside. It's white on the inside. Okay. And what do the men sitting at the table start doing with the head? I mean, they're playing soccer with this thing, kicking it all around. But the body springs forth, reaches down, and picks up the head. And what's going through Sir Gallon's mind? Oh, uh, shit. <laughs> Gets on his horse. 448 or so. See, Gawain, that you carry out your promise exactly. Search for me truly, sir, until I am found. And you have sworn in this hall in the hearing of these knights... So, here's where you need to go. Make your, make your way to the Green Chapel. As the Knight of the Green Chapel, I am widely known. So, if you make search to find me, you cannot possibly fail. Come or merit the name of Craven Coward. The Knight of the Green Chapel, I am widely known. Well, we get into part two, fit two, fit three. He's not widely known as the Knight of the Green Chapel. Because Sir Gowan rides all over creation, and he doesn't find it. All right, we'll stop there. We'll pick up with Fit 2. Let's uh, maybe have a quiz on Tuesday. Long ball and this far of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Also, don't forget... Um, where is it? Don't forget, on the syllabus, you need to recite to me, from memory, 30 or more lines of poetry. Okay, One person has already done it, gotten 100 points. What, like from the poetry that we've already read? Or? It could be from something we've done in the class. It could be from, I would say, actually anything in here. The person who's done it already... 
did it from something we've not done and won't be doing. It's really easier than that.